If you look up here, I'll show you the test out of the camera range. Um, this is one of the longest tests you'll ever take. 90% um, of the time when I take a test, when I, when I give you a test, I have it on one piece of paper. I do whatever I can to, to shorten it up to make it fit on one piece of paper. This time there's no way to do that. Because of the pictures and all the other stuff I have to put on here, um, there's actually going to be three pages. Now when I say it's the longest, that means it's the longest in that respect. Most pages you see. I'm, oh. Every other test you've ever taken has been just um, basically one page. However, time-wise, it's not going to be any longer than any other. It will not be long, even like I know it's a double period tomorrow, but you only need one period to do it. All right. Now, there's no reason to read off those sections. I can basically uh, they aren't actually in exact orders. But what are the really the four things that are going to be on this test? Well, you'll have stuff. Let's go back to my um, first one. Well, go backwards there. Polymers will be on there. We'll get to them. When we go over it. There'll be a whole section on polymers. In fact, the whole last page is on polymers. There'll be stuff on mechanisms. That's the second thing. And there'll be stuff on extraction and uh, and chromatography. Those are those are basically separation techniques. Okay, same kind of questions I asked you in the other worksheets. I don't have any on here. I couldn't put everything on the review, but what else will be on here? Say I told you, well, this guy's got a boiling point of 80 degrees. This guy's got a boiling point of 110. This guy's soluble in water. This guy's soluble in chloroform. You know, and uh, I ask you to tell me what would be the best way to, to separate these guys. Fractional distillation, simple distillation, filtration, extraction, chromatography. All right, there will be one of those on. I didn't actually put it. So there's the four sections. Separation techniques. Now, the big ones will be concentrated on for the separation techniques aren't going to be filtration or decanting or stuff like that. The big ones are going to be extraction, which I'm going to talk about, gas, column, and paper chromatography. All right, those are the big ones because they're the new ones. We've never seen those before this chapter. So that's the first one is, is uh, separation techniques. Then there's mechanisms. Then there's um, polymers. The fourth thing is common naming system, which I'll also do, that guy over there, uh, in a, at the end as well. Remind me. Hopefully we'll get to everything tonight. All right, let's go and start from the beginning here. All right. I'll give you a question like, about extraction. I mean, they're all gonna, this is why it won't take you much longer. There are very few problems where you have to think about them. You either know it or you don't. You either know this is a what? Separatory funnel, or you, or it's, or you don't. I mean, you're not going to have to think about it. All right? Um, the name of the process that we would use this funnel for is what? Extraction. And the names of the layers that I get, I've gotten already multiple mistakes, and I bet I'm going to get some erasing now. I've gotten everything from incredibly bad answers like, what are the names of the, of the two layers? Top and bottom. Honest to God. Top and bottom. Yes. Uh, you're in kindergarten. No. I don't want top or bottom. Uh, other ones would be, that would also be wrong. All right? I don't want you to tell me chloroform versus... Uh, um, soda, okay? That would also be wrong. I want the generic name for these. Uh, what was the one that was on top for us? The what? The aqueous layer. Aqueous. And this was the organic. organic. Now, it doesn't mean they're always in that order. The organic layer, the chloroform we use, is more dense. That's why he was on the bottom. If I put water in the oil into that separatory funnel, the oil, the organic layer, would be on top, and water would be on the bottom. All right, but I'm going to ask you about the lab that we did. And you should know those two names, aqueous and organic. Okay. Um, what do we got now? Three, four. Which of these is probably the lightest? This is a gas chromatic band, and I've talked about that, show you the videos on that. If you ever need to look back, if you're online. Um, but basically, this thing, whatever comes out first, is probably going to be the lightest, the one that's least attracted and probably the least heavy. And that would be, I hope you all put methanol, right? For the, now I would not have, I noticed, I'm not exactly sure why there's this second peak here. I'm not exactly sure what that means. But all you got to look for for the one that's in greatest abundance would be the highest peak, the most area under the curve. The least abundance would be methanol, of course. You can see that. And the highest would be isopropanol. I would hope you would all put that. Now, here comes a mistake. If I haven't seen any erasing yet, and I don't know if I have, you're going to see some now. Because this is interesting. Many people got this wrong. I'll bet you a lot of people divided 4 over 5 to get your RF value. Well, what's wrong with that? Well, there's something wrong with that. Remember how we measured? We measured from the starting point of the dot, which was we drew that pencil line, up to how far the uh, actual color moved. That is not four inches or four centimeters or four or anything. It's how many? One, two, three. Three. Then the distance of the solvent front, the DF values, is the DF. 
that's not terrible last, but and this is ds. The vf value would be the distance from here to how far the solvent front moved. Most people did not do that. Most people just looked at the ruler and where the number was. You don't measure from the bottom of the paper. You measure from where the, the spot started. That's where you measure the RF value from, okay? Y'all got that? All right. So it should have been 3 because it's 1, 2, 3 over 4, 3 fourths or 0.75, okay, for that guy. All right, good enough. So I uh, already found one mistake, but I, maybe there are some other ones in there too. Hopefully not. Uh, let's look at the next one. This is the uh, mechanism one. Now, I spent a fair amount of time yesterday talking about mechanisms, and we spent the last, you know, week on mechanisms, uh, and including a lot of uh, worksheets and stuff like that. The hardest part, I think, for a lot of you is going to be just identifying which mechanism is it undergoing. All right? I didn't give you a general formula. I gave you the actual mechanisms written out here for you. One of them's really easy. What could you tell this guy down here C has to be? Yeah, he doesn't look at all like anything else. The free radical halogenation is completely different. Now, you should know from yesterday that it would be free radical halogenation if I took you know, something like a, a simple alkane, C2H6, and added, say, chlorine to it. I'm not actually adding, like here I've got two guys. I've got something on that alkane and added to something else, and they're going to switch places. When you have just an alkane and you're halogenating him, he's going to be free radical halogenation. That's what he's going to undergo. And we'll talk about the questions on him in a minute. Now, let's get to these questions up here. Identify each mechanism. We just identified him. This guy right here is a two-step mechanism. Now, we've seen other two-step mechanisms. Don't automatically assume, well, I remember this. It's backwards. It's two steps. Therefore, it's SN1. That's correct in this case. But what else is two steps? The electrophilic addition is two steps as well. How do you know this is not electrophilic addition? How do you know? Very simple. It's electrophilic addition I did not put on here, although we've seen it a couple of times. You know, an addition is a reaction. You get a product. You give two products. Exactly. That was a, I heard a lot of other people saying stuff out there, but that's probably your best way. In an addition reaction, you're going to take something plus something else and get one product. In substitution reactions, you're taking two things and switching things off of there, so you have two things over here. That would be a substitution reaction. This is an addition reaction with just one thing being formed. And here's another way you can tell. I didn't hear anybody say this either. Any of these guys have a double bond in them? Addition reactions are most common with double bonds. And I don't have a double bond in these guys. These are substitution reactions. Okay? So, as I'm sure many of you memorized, although it's not just about memorization, how it's backwards, although that hap does help, I know, in this case. A two-step mechanism is going to be SN1. And the one-step mechanism, this guy right here, is going to be SN2. The reason for that is, I'll try to explain it one more time, in this two-step mechanism, the reason these two steps is he's got these large alkyl groups around him. He's going to probably be a tertiary or at least a secondary uh, halogen on that carbon. All right, uh, the carbon is going to be a secondary or tertiary. So he can make a carbonium ion that's relatively stable. All right, it's, it can be stabilized by those adjacent al alpha groups. Whereas this guy down here, who's a primary carbon, he's going to go by SN2, all happening at the same time, because that OH can get in there. There's no steric hindrance. There's nothing in the way. You've got to be able to explain that in terms uh, of uh, how I just did right here. Steric hindrance drives this guy, the back of it. The stability of the carbocation drives that guy, all right? So tertiary is better up here, then secondary, then primary. Here it's the exact opposite. I want primary. Whoops. Primary. He'll be the best way for him to go. Secondary and then tertiary. Because if I got tertiary, I got all kinds of junk in the way, all right, for that OH to get in there, okay? So you know this guy is SN1, and he's two steps. He's SN2, and he's one step, and we know he's free radical halogenation. We don't see, although we've seen before, electrophilic addition. Let's identify all these things. Where is the electrophile in the first one? I'm sure a lot of people wrote water. Yeah, OH. OH. No. Neither. It's not electrophilic substitution. It's nucleophilic substitution. There's no electrophile in this guy. Yes. There is no electrophile. What would an electrophile be attracted to? Electrophile. Electrons. So when I have my, my um, uh, addition reaction, 
that area of double bond, it's sharing, another way to write that would be like that, it's sharing two pair of electrons. The HBr or OH or whatever is going to be attracted to this negatively charged area here. This positive hydrogen is going to be attracted there. He is an electrophile. I don't have anybody attracted to a negative thing in that first reaction, nor do I have it in the second reaction, nor do I have it in a free radical halogenation. Okay? No electrophiles. But there are nucleophiles. Where's my nucleophile in the first one? Well, I would accept either one, OH or H2O, but it's, uh, it's the OH that actually attaches, so you probably want to put OH, okay? If you had circled the H2O, it kind of looks like the H2O because it has this plus water, okay? I, I understand that. But OH would be a better answer of who's the actual nucleophile. Uh, and here, same thing, the OH is the nucleophile, okay? I asked you to um, identify any carbocations. I hope you underlined him or wrote down him or drew him. Is there a carbocation in this no. one? No, there's not. There's no, we did not split anybody off. It all happened at the same time. And it resulted in, here's some other things to keep in mind. I didn't mention this, and maybe I'll probably keep, I'll post this one up. It works. Let's not forget about stereochemical inversion. This guy always attacks to the back side, flips the molecule around. This guy, you got about half and half. You're going to get racemization. You're going to get a mixture of the two different uh, places where you can add that OH or bromine or whatever it is that you're adding. Okay? All right. Now, let's get down to, what's the next question? Uh, identify the free radicals. That obviously doesn't apply to these two guys. It applies to this guy down here. If I wanted to identify the free radicals, it's going to be anybody with an unpaired electron. Here, here. Now, I won't ask you to do this for this many. I'll say, like, steps two or three, identify the free radicals. Because there are a ton of them. Here's one. Here's one. Uh... Here's one, here's one, make sure I don't miss any. Here's one, here's one, here's one, here's one, here's one, and here's one. They're all free radicals, okay? Well, leaving that up there, leaving that red up there, let's try to go on to the next step, next question. What are the chain propagating steps? In a chain propagating step, you're going to start with a free radical, and you're going to regenerate a free radical. That's why it's a chain reaction. You're also going to probably pr produce some product at the same time. Okay, so this guy does that. Does that guy do it? No. Doesn't he? Yeah. Free radical on the left, free radical on the right. Absolutely it does. So that's a chain propagating as well. Is this chain propagating? No. Some people say yes because it makes a free radical. That's not chain propagating. That's chain initiating because it took somebody who was not a free radical. So no, he is not. How about over here? These are clearly chain what? Terminate. No free radicals on this side. So the only ones that are chain propagating are these two right here that we see. Okay, and you have to look at the free radicals being made on both uh, being on both sides of the equation of the arrow. Okay, all right, good enough. All right, so you know you're going to get all that stuff on there, and you have to understand these mechanisms. You have to be able to explain steric hindrance, uh, the stability of the carbonium ion. You got to explain racemization versus inversion. All of that and why that happens and why these go by nucleophilic substitution. Nucleophile, electrophile, all that stuff, carbonium ion. Now, the last page, before I get to the uh, naming, is uh, this guy right here. And the questions I want you to do on here are very similar. Now, I told you I put up here, I think, what you would find to be very typical ones in the test. I would expect you would know this guy, for example, not because you have to memorize him. I could put anybody in here for that R group, and it would be the same thing. The reason you should know him is very simple. Each of these guys has an amine group on them and an acid group on them. Has an acid group on them and an amine group on them. So what do we call guys who have amines and acids on them? Amino acids, which you should know is going to form a polypeptide, right? You should know it's going to form a polypeptide. I didn't say autumn. I don't know where autumn is. Um, anyway, all right. So you should know this guy not because you have to memorize all the possible amino acids there are. You know, leucine, glycine, all these other amino acids. By no means. You simply recognize the amine part, the acid part. You're going to get a polypeptide. Same reason you should recognize this guy down here. We had more of ester reactions than any other organic reaction we saw. We had a lab on it. We had five different esters we made in lab and wrote the formulas for them. We had them in worksheets. We had them on a test. Here's what makes this guy an ester reaction. Right there. Here's your acid part. Oops, I'm going to use red for that. Here's your acid part. Here's your base part. Well, your OH, your alcohol part. Alcohols plus 
your acid, an alcohol and acid added together, versus an amine and an acid, amino acids. Make it amino acids, polypeptides, great. Um, linking them together. Ester reaction isn't carboxylic acid and alcohol, but it's a dicarboxylic acid and a dialcohol. So we can grow this chain in any direction. So if this is the ester reaction, what must this be? Polyester. Polyester. Now, people on their worksheets, if you look over your old worksheets, and a lot of people just get them back and throw them away, never even bother to correct them. Many people call this and this polyurethane, nylon. You called it all kinds of stuff because you saw an N. Oh, I saw an N once before, so I'll call it polyurethane. You know, no, you have to look at what's actually reacting, and you don't have to memorize this as much as you have to understand what an ester reaction is and what an amino acid reaction is, and that's good. Now, up here is another guy should be very familiar to you. Again, I'm using ones that I would expect you've seen before in biology or somewhere else. This is going to be a polysaccharide, okay, taking sugar molecules and linking them together. What particular polysaccharide? That requires some memorization. It's a starch because they're all the same way, right? They're not flipped upside, upside down every other one. This guy right here, polyvinyl chloride. All right, and there's another one I, would, I could make out of this guy that would be very familiar to you, and we talked about as well. Um, and that would be if I just had an H wherever one of these chlorines is. What would I call them then? Polyethylene. Polyethylene, which is like saran wrap. Polyvinyl chloride, which is used for piping, PVC pipes. Okay. Which, by the way, let's skip us ahead. Give us a use for each of these. I just did. Um, uh, polyvinyl chloride would be for piping. Polyethylene would be for saran wrap. Protein synthesis would be for this. Uh, polyester clothes. Um, and, of course, poly, uh, I would, what would you use? What do you use carbohydrates? What do you use um, the polysaccharides for? Food, basically. Energy, yeah. You're going to eventually break them down and, and uh, use it for energy. All right, I still didn't do addition or condensation on here. Let's take a look. How do I know addition versus condensation? Do be careful on this, please. Uh, you should always look for some other molecule being split off. And in this case, the first one has water to split off. That is condensation. This guy does not. And, and I might have it written like this as well. That is going to be addition. This guy does have water split off. What does that make? And this guy, look carefully. I, a lot of these don't fit on one line. You know, this does have water condensation again. Okay? So there you have it. All right, now. What's that? Right, that's what I'm gonna, I actually have it written down here, although I may need to erase some stuff on it first. Oh, did it go away? Darn it. I, I, I didn't think I meant. I, oh, I, I bet when I shut off the thing, it went away. Um, I had that one written out. I'll draw it again because I want, if we have time, I want people to see it at home too. So, what is it, 10 in the row there, right? Yeah, yeah. Right, let's try to draw this quick. Oh, wait. And this guy over here. And then I've got this guy down here. And then I've got. Chlorine. Double bond, chlorine, 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 and then I've got three up. Three up. There's a third. They were in a straight line. It doesn't really matter if it's not anyway. But here, okay. And then what do I have after that? Double bond over here. Now I didn't fill in all the H's around them to to save me some, myself some time. But let's try to name this guy. I told you three things to do here. The way to start these out. You are going to get to use these. Okay? You have the precedent sheet, you can use it. Okay? First things first, though. Find the longest carbon chain. Don't expect that I will draw it out necessarily with the longest carbon chain like it is. Okay? Find the longest carbon chain. <clears throat> it happens to be deck, right? 10. So I call this deck something we don't know yet. Oic oh, oh, acid. Okay, it's going to be something. Oh, look, acid. Oh, right, that's the second part. I, I kind of skip it ahead. First, find the longest chain. Second, find the highest precedence. If you look on this sheet, the highest precedence of the things that are on there, the groups that are on there, carboxylic acid, ether, halogens, double bonds, uh, methyl groups, and ketones, the highest thing on there is carboxylic acid. So I'm going to end it in oh, look, acid. So I got deck something oh, look, acid. Mm -hmm. I want to make sure I don't use decane, because it, it, only if I have single bonds. So the third thing I check. First, longest chain. Second, highest precedence. Third, unsaturation. I've got a double bond right here. That's going to make it ene, decenoic. And I have the number in one, two, three, four, four decenoic acid. 
Okay? Uh, if you have to put, if I had a double and a triple in there, I'd have to put, you know, four en five decinoic acid. Okay? Uh, one of the, only one of them can go in here. I can't put decin decine. I can't put them twice. Okay? So it would have to just have like a five y n e y n or or four e n. I forget which gets highest precedence uh, on the sheet. E n gets higher precedence. So yeah, the y n will be out here then. Okay. All right. All right. So you have that sheet to look at. Let's do the rest of them backwards. Technically, I should do them in alphabetical order. I will not take off points for that. Don't worry about it. So we could go with uh, no. Uh, let's just go in order here, but not because it doesn't that. But that's wrong for a different reason. Okay, one, two, three. Three, what is this guy right here? Yeah, a lot of people want to put, last period, people were raising it at this point, alkoxy. They looked it up, it says alkoxy. Alk means one methyl group, whatever the methyl group is. This guy happens to be one long, one carbon, so it's methoxy. And he's on the one, two, third carbon, so he's three methoxy. Methoxy, methoxy. Okay, three methoxy. Let me just, show, for those people who are a little confused, say that had this. What if it had that on there? It would be called ethoxy. Exactly. All right. Now let's go to the next guy. Yeah. Four, five, dichloro. Four, five, dichloro. Next guy, uh, this is one, two, oh, we already did the double bond. Five, six, seven. Seven. And those are all in a straight line. I, it doesn't look like it, but they are because they've got bent up there. So that guy would be um, seven n propyl. Seven n propyl. Because it could have been, you know, isopropyl. Okay. Uh, and seven what? Seven terp butyl. And then this guy right here, nine oxo. Wow, is that fun or what? Look at that. Hey, the bell's going to ring in 30 seconds, but one last thing before you go. I do not have time to go over, but you have several examples on your sheets. Shh, wait, wait, wait. Look here. Okay? Several examples on your sheets of where I will give you um, substance 1, substance 2, substance 3, boiling points, solubilities, phase. And then you've got to tell me, is it going to be decanting, filtration? Uh, you know, you've got to figure that out. Okay?